The Shaping Opinion podcast is brought to you by O'Brien Communications, an independent corporate communications firm. O'Brien Communications helps clients of all sizes with corporate communications and strategic planning, marketing communications, public relations and media relations, content development and writing, and crisis and issues management. Learn more at O'BrienCommunications.com. Can you describe how you learned you won the Nobel Prize and what it felt like? I can describe it. <laughs> and, and every day that passes, more feelings come into that. I uh, was sound asleep in my hotel room in Dallas, Texas, where I had been scheduled to give a seminar and meet with people at UT Southwestern. I had just arrived very late that night, and the phone rang at 4 o'clock in the morning and roused me from my sleep. It was the Nobel Prize Committee, not a disaster from home. Uh, And so it was good news for once. And how did you feel when you got that call? Terrified, exhilarated, and dying to share the news with my sons. But the Nobel Committee told me I had to wait 25 minutes for the press announcement before I could call anyone, so I took a shower instead. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion podcast, we're joined by Nobel Prize recipient Frances Arnold. She pioneered something called directed evolution that harnesses the power of evolution to enhance products throughout society, from biofuels and pharmaceuticals to agriculture, chemicals, and paper products, and more. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today, we're going to talk with Frances about her journey and her work that is changing the world for the better. One of the first things we need to do is go over some terms we'll be using in today's episode. The first one is enzymes. Enzymes are substances that reside in living organisms of all kinds. Enzymes are the things that regulate chemical reactions. You can't ferment wine, leavened bread, curdle cheese, or brew beer without enzymes. To make it just right, you need to know something about how enzymes guide the process. In medicine, enzymes are used to kill microorganisms that cause disease. They are used to promote wound healing and help diagnose some diseases. In humans and other animals, enzymes carry out almost all of the thousands of chemical reactions that need to take place in cells. They also help with the formation of new molecules. They do this by reading the genetic information stored in DNA. The second term we'll use is proteins. Proteins are large, complex molecules that play a number of critical roles in the human body. They do most of the work of cells and are required for the structure, function, and regulation of our body's tissues and organs. Those are the basics. The point is, Living things cannot grow, develop, or evolve without proteins and enzymes. And since we use many living organisms in the medicines we take, the foods we eat, the beverages we drink, and the countless products we use to make our lives better, knowing how to use enzymes the right way makes more things possible. That's where Frances Arnold comes in. She has found a way not only to use enzymes for society, but also to alter those enzymes for specific purposes. This is about evolution. What it took nature millions of years to do to change one enzyme, Francis has found a way to do in weeks, and that's just a start. This is our conversation. Francis, before we talk about your work and what it means, I'd like to learn more about you and how you've gotten to this point. And let's start with high school, because I've done some reading on you, and I've learned that your high school years were what we might think are unconventional for someone who has achieved so much in the field of science. Can you tell us about your high school years? High school years, well, I was uh, unconventional in one sense, in that I was uh, not a great student, and I often didn't even go to school. I was working long hours at uh, a jazz club and Uh, at a nightclub. I also um, had other odd jobs. But those, in another sense, it was conventional because those were the 70s. This was the years 
of protest against the Vietnam War. We didn't believe what our parents told us. And many of us felt that we could forge a better path. You went to Princeton then after your high school years, where you received your bachelor's degree in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Then you earned your master's degree in chemical engineering at UC Berkeley. And then you became a professor at Caltech. Can you describe the journey from becoming a mechanical engineer to working in chemistry? It was a gradual, let's say an evolutionary path, going from one field to the other, As a result of changes in society and changes in needs, I went to Princeton and studied mechanical engineering because I wasn't sure what I was interested in, and that option gave me time to try other things. I happened to really like mechanical engineering by the time I finished and started uh, as a solar energy engineer. I was a researcher at the Solar Energy Research Institute in Golden, Colorado. A change in uh, national goals, however, from 20% renewable energy by the year 2000 to low oil prices and uh, rapid consumption of fossil fuels uh, with the change of political administration made me rethink the solar energy path. Uh, So I took off west to UC Berkeley and decided to work on biological thing as a chemical engineer. I had finally grown up enough to appreciate chemistry. So I was able to study biochemistry and biotechnology at the beginning of the DNA revolution. These were heady times. I got my PhD in chemical engineering then with an emphasis on biotechnology right when this whole new revolution in in technology was happening, that we could actually read and write DNA. What was it about DNA that captured your imagination? Well, DNA is not that interesting by itself. It's the proteins that it encodes that are really the fascinating molecules. I had started my career as a mechanical engineer thinking I would work on in the aerospace industry, but that fell apart at the end of Vietnam War. Uh, and I wanted to work on the most complicated things on the, p- on the planet. Well, it turns out that the most complicated things to engineer on the planet are the proteins, the workhorses of life that convert one form of matter into living, uh, adapting organisms. When I realized that and realized the beauty of these molecules and what they could do and what they could do for human beings, That captured my imagination, and that's where I wanted to be an engineer. At that point in time, what were your expectations of your own career? Did you have a particular vision in mind, or were you just mainly focused on, as you said, the the complicated problems right in front of you? I was focused on the problems right in front of me. I didn't think that much about the future until I actually had to make a choice of what kind of job I would take and what I would do, and that was the end of my graduate studies. So it happened at the very end that I said, well, maybe I could do this job. Maybe I could be a researcher and a teacher, because I am very much a teacher, by the way. I teach classes at Caltech, and I have a group of 20 people who work with me on all this science and hundreds over the years. And I felt that that would be something meaningful and that I perhaps could do well. When you started working then on these problems and you were focused on the problems at hand, was there any one point that you might have felt you were onto something, something new and different? Well, when when I went to Caltech as a protein engineer, when no one really knew how to do this, uh, I was first terrified because nothing that others had tried really worked very well. And I was not going to be successful doing it the way that other people were doing it at the time. I discovered that, discovered what nature had already discovered billions of years ago, that this evolution, basically breeding molecules in the laboratory, much like we breed cats and dogs, could circumvent our profound ignorance of how the DNA sequence encodes a protein. And when I did the first experiment, right, right from the very beginning, it was apparent to me that I was onto something big because it worked. 
the system told me the answers. What was that experiment? Our first experiments were with well-known, well-characterized enzymes, proteases, that break down proteins. You find them in your laundry detergent, for example. They take stains off of clothes, which is a highly non-natural thing for an enzyme to do, but it's useful for human beings. We worked on these proteins to show that we could uh, force them to function very well in highly non-natural environments. We chose an organic solvent just to prove that having water around or lots of or all water around was not a requirement for their function. And in fact, they could learn how to tolerate high concentrations of non-natural solvents. And what was the outcome? The outcome was that they could. <laughs> that, and this was what was so surprising, is that with a relatively few number of changes to the DNA sequence that encodes the protein, the protein could adapt in real time, in our hands, to do something that no human could design it to do. And then it told us, we had this DNA sequence that encoded this new function, we could see where the mutations were, and we couldn't even explain them, much less predict them. That's when we knew we were onto something because the system was teaching us the rules that we couldn't see for ourselves. Was there a particular problem you were trying to solve as you started that first experiment? Did you have a certain expectation what you were trying to do there that you thought might be different? Well, we knew that that uh, what well, what we were our expectation was that if we were lucky, the protein would learn how to do this. And that if we were lucky, it would do it quickly with a small number of mutations. But we didn't have a real expectation. Um, we were lucky that it, well, lucky. Nature, nature adapts very quickly. And what we discovered is that we could recapitulate that innovation capability of the biological world to adapt quickly. We could see that in the laboratory. That's a very good description of a case, I think, that helps us understand a little bit more about directed evolution, which is the area that you've been honored for, not only by the Nobel Committee, but also by other awards committees, too, over the years. And, and it's made such an impact. I think the best place to start for those of us who do not have a scientific background is to look at how society was different before directed evolution and how it might be now and going forward. Can you describe some of the innovations that directed evolution has already helped change in society? Well, work from many other laboratories, not mine, but the hundreds of laboratories that adopted these methods has generated a tremendous array of products that people use in their daily lives, the enzymes in your laundry detergent, to things that manufacture uh, uh, chemicals and fuels more efficiently so that we don't have to have toxic metals or organic solvents in many of these chemical manufacturing processes. They're used in you know, making blue jeans. They're used in making therapeutic treatments for disease. They're used in a, a wide variety of, <laughs> a surprising variety of products that biotechnology contributes to. Can you tell us a little bit more then about what is directed evolution? Well, it's this, this molecular breeding process. I breed molecules in a test tube, pretty much like people breed cats and dogs and racehorses and corn. I take, but I do it in the test tube. Instead of you know, having a cat mated with another cat, I can take DNA that encodes a cat protein, for example, and mate it or mutate it, just the DNA in a test tube. With recombinant DNA technology, I can insert that DNA into a bacterium who will read the DNA and make the protein that it encodes. I sort the bacteria into 
uh, an array, a, a, a bunch of wells on a plate, and then I do chemistry, I figure out which of those proteins is better than its parent, right? So you, you know, if you're breeding a cat, you're looking for certain traits. If you're breeding an enzyme, you're looking for certain properties that I know how to measure. And when I find one that starts to exhibit that behavior, I can take its DNA and start the process all over again. That's a very good description of how DNA works. And in one of the articles I read about you, I thought you summarized it pretty well, too, for the layman. And you described it as enlisting the help of nature's design process, evolution, to come up with better enzymes. And that you can do what it, take, what it used to take nature millions of years in just a matter of weeks. Well, not only can I do what nature has done, I can recapitulate the solutions to the problem of life. But even more interesting, perhaps, is that I can take nature where she's never gone. For example, if you want an enzyme to do something for a human being, something non-natural, then you have to not only use evolution, but direct it in a particular way. So it really is like making a poodle, right? A poodle you wouldn't find in the natural world were it not for humans to direct the evolution of of that organism. But it serves a purpose that we define. So with an enzyme, I can make an enzyme that serves a new purpose and use the beauty of nature. It might be very efficient, for example. Uh, And that's something that nature can do and humans don't know how to design. In 2009, you and your team engineered enzymes that break down cellulose. Can you explain that situation? So that's a nice example. Uh, these cellulase enzymes are made by nature. Their function is to break down cellulose into sugars that a microorganism can then use to ferment. And we use it, for example, to make ethanol. Humans have done that for 10,000 years. But these cellulase enzymes allow us to derive the sugar from, for example, waste agricultural products or renewable trees. They're not very efficient. Those enzymes are slow, and they're just good enough for the purpose that nature intended, but they're not good enough for us. They're not good enough to bring the price of these renewable fuels down so they can compete with pumping oil out of the ground. Therefore, we used directed evolution to improve their properties, and specifically, we made them work at higher temperatures, higher than anything the natural organisms would ever encounter. When we did that, they became faster. Everybody gets faster when it's warm, and uh, enzymes do that too. So they became faster and more useful for uh, making fuels from, from renewable resources. That's interesting. What, what was the reaction when you, started to, when you started to achieve these results and you started working with outside organizations, companies, people who could actually use these innovations – can you describe some of the reactions from the people or perhaps even tell a story or two of, of how these things change the way people think? It's interesting when I think back on the reactions, when someone has to solve a problem, for example, if you're working in a company and your company tells you you've got to come up with a solution that's t- twice as good as what you had before, you're going to use whatever method works. So in industry, where people were making products using enzymes and were very eager to get new and improved enzymes, they said, yes, they loved this method because it didn't tell them, it didn't seem like advanced science. It seemed like obvious practical engineering. Uh, On the other hand, uh, other people looked at it and said, well, it's not really scientific to breed a molecule. If you can't design it, that's really not so interesting. But anybody who had to solve the problem was thrilled. Francis, now when someone comes to you with a problem, is there a process that you've learned that you've fine-tuned over the years, a starting point for looking at a problem to find out if directed evolution can make a difference? You bet. It's very simple. Directed evolution is not creation. We do not evolve things out of nothing. So we have to find, if you want to make a racehorse, it's unlikely you're going to make it from a cat. So we have to find something that's close to our 
desired rate source, an enzyme that catalyzes some interesting new reaction, and close enough that this simple evolutionary process can take over and, and make something useful. So our process is we look for the proto racehorse. We look through the vast diversity of the biological world to find a protein that may have this capability. So I'm, I'm like a big trainer. I have to go out and look through you know, the high school students and decide who is most likely to be the next Taekwondo champion. (laughs) And if you've got a good eye, you can do that. Well, I have a good eye for what proteins can do. How did you learn to do that? Uh, 30 years of experience. (laughs) And a lot of other brains. The other, the other thing is that most of this is not done by me. I I provided a a, a basic uh, set of ideas back in the 1990s but these demonstrations that I talk about, they're done by my students or my colleagues or my collaborators at other institutions. And collectively, we've all learned to look at biology, not just for what it does right now, but for what it could do with this ability to train it. One of the things that you said that I thought was really almost poetic, you said, I copy nature's design process. There's a tremendous beauty and complexity of the biological world, but it all comes about through this one simple, beautiful design algorithm. Can you describe why there is only one design algorithm and why, why it works the way it does? Well, there's, there's one algorithm in the sense that evolution has given rise to everything. Right? We don't know how life was created But since the last universal common ancestor, almost 4 billion years ago, all the diversity of life has come about through evolution. And we can trace our DNA all the way back to some original organism. So if if everything of great complexity on the planet, from molecules to ecosystems, was made by this process, to me it sounds obvious that that should be the process by which to create yet more diversity. Directed evolution is at work in hundreds of laboratories and companies that make everything from, as you said, laundry detergent to medicines to drugs. What do you see as the potential for the future for directed evolution? I think we've just barely scratched the surface of what biology can do for us. I hope that directed evolution will be one of the key mechanisms by which we move biology in directions that help our planet, help human beings, and especially help our planet so that we can have a good quality of life without destroying everything in the environment. I think that biology can help us do that and that evolution is the way that that will, one of the ways that will happen. Are there any lessons from your whole experience, your whole process, for young scientists who might be coming up and looking at new problems or maybe new ways to do things? Collect wisdom and experiences like you collect money, right? It it is like putting money in the bank. It may not seem useful at the time, but you never know when something you've learned will pop up as a solution to a completely different problem. I did many different things before I became a professor at Caltech, uh, and those experiences helped me think in a very different way from other colleagues who might have taken a straighter path. So sometimes it's necessary to take a zigzag path, or it's useful to take a zigzag path to where you want to go. Francis Arnold, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Make sure to check out our show notes for more information on everything that we talked about today. You'll find a bio on our guest, Frances Arnold, and you'll find more information on her Nobel Prize and her work. You can also listen to other episodes. We want to know what you think. 
On Twitter, just tweet to us at Shaping Opinion. Or you can get in touch with us through our website, shapingopinion.com. You can subscribe to the Shaping Opinion podcast in many ways, and they're all free and easy to find on your favorite podcast channel. This is where we talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien.